All right, so we're back in farm, switching gears a little bit. It always feels like putting on a nice, comfortable pair of shoes when I get back into farm. Like, because I'm still a little like making sure I got everything right, and you know, so my second time doing it. This I've been doing for like five years, so it's pretty, pretty well tread ground here. But anywho, brand new to you. This is why we're going over it. But uh, any questions from the first lecture we had for farm? Question about like routes of administration or anything like that we cover. All right, so continuing. On about receptor signaling, right? Because again, every drug has to interact with some sort of receptor in order for So again, receptors are going to be that component of a cell or organism. We kind of cover this a little bit in the farm, but it's going to, what's going to be interacting with the drugs. And basically, it's initiating some sort of uh, chain of events that will lead to a change in function, right? So for instance, if I bind to uh, one particular type of receptor, I, I can see a downstream effect where maybe blood pressure goes down, or maybe my blood sugar goes down, or whatever it happens to be. Whatever physiologic effect we're, we're looking at, it's usually going to be mediated through some sort of receptor here. And so, again, we're going to see this communication between cells. Um, you know, when you're looking at from cell to cell con or, uh, uh, communication, you're just going to depend on, on different types of signaling molecules. In some cases, the drugs we're using are trying to mimic the sort of signaling molecules that um, they would use normally. Sometimes they're kind of introducing brand new antibiotics that look nothing like what our body normally would make. Um, we'll look at a few different types of cell signaling here about how they can kind of transmit from one cell to another. Um, and again, many of our drugs are going to be working kind of similar to this. So, um, again, receptors are typically a specific protein. Um, and where do you think receptors lie within the cell? Usually on the cell surface. In some cases, you're actually going to find that some drugs will be transported into the cell and can work intracellularly. They may work at the nucleus in order to affect things like gene transcription. Uh, you know, a lot of steroids like glucocorticoids can do that. Um, in some cases, you may find, uh, especially with like antibiotics, they have a lot of varied mechanisms, but sometimes they actually have to get into the bacterial cell and they can work on things like the ribosomes and affect protein production, you know, different things like that. But basically, um, most of the time when we're looking at affecting human cells, most of the times the receptors are right there at the surface. And so the effector is basically going to be um, the mechanism that gets activated by the receptor, whatever kind of downstream effects that are occurring there. And we'll talk about uh, second messenger systems. And the first messenger is typically going to be whatever is binding to that receptor. Whatever happening afterwards, we're considering to be the second messenger. And I'll show you some examples of that and why, how it comes into play when we're dealing with um, some of these different medications. So different types of cell signaling, certainly there can be kind of contact dependent sort of signaling here where cells are right next to one another. Usually drugs aren't really kind of mimicking this whatsoever, but this is really important um, for uh, different aspects. And one of the things I think about is going to be cancer. When you think about cancer, you think about cells um, kind of replicating kind of uh, without kind of any kind of limitation there, which is what cancer is. Um, oftentimes you're going to find that they have this kind of cell contact dependent uh, effect where they, they don't continue to grow if they're kind of surrounded by their own cells essentially, right? So that we don't kind of have this unchecked replication. You end up losing that when you have a uh, cancer cell, and they kind of just continue growing, um, you know, kind of ad infinitum essentially until they kind of outstrip their nutrient supply. Drugs don't work around, around with this mechanism too often. However, this is an important one. You may try to uh, intercede here with certain types of medications. <clears throat> It's also good for immune function as well, especially if you're thinking about like, you know, cells coming up and they're kind of recognizing, hey, is this a bacteria or is this a, a normal human cell, whatever it happens to be, it's important for uh, you know, immune function. Well, paracrine signaling, which is basically a signaling cell that can release some sort of uh, mediator. And usually this is going to be pretty close within the same tissue, essentially, that releasing that mediator and kind of communicating with other cells. This is very important, uh, synaptic signaling. This is going to come up uh, very frequently when we're talking about things like uh, psychotropic medications, so things like for depression or things for, um, you know, uh, you know, schizophrenia, all these kind of different medications. A lot of them we're going to be talking about um, affecting kind of this neuronal transmission here, the synaptic transmission. Um, and normally what you're finding here is normally they have the neuron that's going to be releasing at the neurotransmitter. We call this kind of the... Um, uh, the you know the terminal end plate here, where it's going to be releasing neurotransmitters and usually t uh, signaling a cell here. So you know this could be uh, serotonin, it could be dopamine, it could be all sorts of different things that can be releasing onto these target cells. Which this may be a neuron or it could be a, a, an actual tissue you're dealing with. You know, say for instance, if it's um, you know the sympathetic nervous system, it's going to be dumping out onto the heart. This may be a myocardial cell that's being uh, uh, being affected by things like epinephrine or something, right? So lots of different ways, and we'll we'll see this come up again and again when we get into especially the psych meds. Very very important here. <clears throat> 
And then this is probably the way that most drugs are going to be sort of acting like, sort of uh, mimicking is going to be this kind of endocrine signaling. We've already mentioned this quite uh, quite recently, uh, as of yesterday in, in physio, where again, endocrine cells release their hormones into the bloodstream, and then they can travel around and affect all sorts of different cells. Most drugs are kind of working like this. If I either give it intravenously, straight into the vein, or if I were to give it orally, maybe it gets absorbed through the GI tract into the liver and then into the sensitive circulation. Um, basically, a lot of drugs are kind of working similar to this sort of endocrine sort of mechanism. Right? So uh, again, something we're pretty familiar with already. All right, so our receptors can be many different things. In some cases, you may actually find enzymes are being affected directly. So uh, you may find that enzymes can be um, affected, be stimulated. Sometimes they can be inhibited by different types of medications. A really good example of this would be the drug called methotrexate. Anyone ever heard of methotrexate before? Uh, what do we use it for? Yeah, rheumatoid arthritis is a big one. Anyone know what else? It's a big cancer drug as well. It's a kind of, it's a very old school sort of drug, but it's been around for forever. We use it for a lot of autoimmune conditions. We use it a lot for uh, cancer. Those are the two big places you're going to see it used. And so basically what it's doing is actually targeting a specific enzyme. By inhibiting that enzyme, you can do things like inhibit cell replication. Uh, by inhibiting DNA replication, you can uh, do all sorts of things with it. And so here we find that there's an enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase, and that actually gets targeted by methotrexate. And so basically, in order to produce thymidine, which we know is what? What's thymidine? Remember, that's important for, for DNA. Remember, it's one of our nucleotides that we produce, right? Remember that? Our A, T, C, and G, all that good stuff. Okay, go back to that lecture. You can review that. Um, but anyway, so we need thymidine. Um, and so in order uh, to produce new DNA, right? And so if I inhibit that, then I can't make thymidine, then I cannot produce new DNA. That cell oftentimes will end up undergoing, remember anyone remember that cell death that is programmed? Yeah, it usually will trigger off apoptosis. That's how, we, that's how we kill off these cancerous cells. And, and again, cancer cells are at, rapidly replicating. They always need new DNA to be produced. So by inhibiting that, you kill off the cell. And so there's an enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase. And actually, this is uh, what we call this is a folic acid antagonist because you basically, your cells cannot use folic acid in order to produce that thymidine. So by giving methotrexate, you shut this whole process down, and then now I can't produce new thymidine. There's other drugs that can affect this as well, like 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU. I'm not saying that to be mean to you guys. I'm just, I like you oh, guys, but, uh, you know, 5 you. Um, anyway, so this is just an example of methotrexate. You don't have to memorize a specific example. We're going to talk about this again in form when we come up to the actual drugs themselves. But just know that enzymes can be a target, and then there's many different types of enzymes we can affect with our medications. I always hear the most typing when I say, you don't need to know this for the test. Like, or <laughs> oh, this might be on the test. Everything else is not really. Um, in some cases, we may try to affect things like transport proteins. And so we've talked about these already when we were talking about action potentials uh, in, in physio. But basically, we can affect these proteins here that are meant to allow certain substances across that cell membrane. Very frequently, these tend to be ion channels, right? And so a good example here would be the sodium potassium ATPase pump, right? Again, it rears its ugly head. And I, know, I love this pump. I talk about it all the time. But this is a, a, a pump that is, again, meant to maintain that resting membrane potential within the cell, right? So especially myocardial cells this is very important. And so has anyone heard of the drug digoxin before? Very old drug again, but used for arrhythmias, usually for like atrial fibrillation, things like that, and uh, sometimes for congestive heart failure. And so we can give this. This is actually an inhibitor of the sodium potassium pump. And so we will give this, and basically you can see here's a myocardial cell. You can actually inhibit this cell right here. So that way I'm not pumping out that sodium against the concentration gradient, I'm not pumping potassium into the cell. And by inhibiting that, there's some downstream effects where essentially I can allow the heart to beat stronger, which is good because if I have someone with congestive heart failure, you're going to learn they usually have poor left ventricular function. And that left ventricle is really important because what does the left ventricle do? Pumps blood systemically, right? It gets it out to the, the rest of the body. So if that's not pumping well, then I'm not going to be pumping blood out, and then that's that, that CHF that comes up. Um, by allowing the heart to be stronger, I get more blood out of there. I get a better cardiac output. We call that an ejection fraction. That is something that that uh, digoxin can potentially help with, right? So that is one way. That's one target that we have with with looking at digoxin and affecting that transport protein. There's also structural proteins we can affect. Uh, is anyone uh, familiar with gout? Right? What is gout? Increase of uric acid usually affects what, um, what tissue? Yeah, usually joints, but also kind of classically. The big toe, some people call it the great toe. I think it's an okay toe, but the big toe is typically what gets affected there. But colchicine is a drug. It's, a, again, a very old drug we used in order to to affect this uh, that disease state. It actually helps. Uh, and it works by actually uh, affecting the, the microtubules. Remember the microtubules we talked about during mitosis? They work to kind of pull 
the uh, the chromosomes apart during cell replication, we can inhibit that by giving something that actually affects the structural proteins. In this case, colchicine would be a good example of that. And so by using that, we can help to relieve some of the, um, the inflammation and, and, and different uh, kind of painful aspects of gout. So that's one medication we use that for that pretty, pretty frequently. Again, you don't have to memorize the specific drug examples here, but again, just know that these are the different targets we can look at for our, our medications. Okay, so the main type of drug receptors we're going to be looking at can be broken up into uh, four different types. One are going to be our ion channel receptors. We're going to have G protein coupled receptors, a lot of enzyme linked receptors, and then intracellular receptors. I'll show you kind of some examples of these as we go forward. So, um, again, most of the time you're going to find that most of these drugs are working at cell surface level receptors. So, again, they can just bind right on the outside of the cell, and that will cause some sort of secondary messenger system to be activated and cause whatever effect you're looking for, whether it be blood pressure effects or heart rate or blood sugar, or whatever it happens to be. Sometimes you're going to find some drugs will actually be uh, carried into the cell and then work at somewhere like the site of the nucleus, right? So, again, it just depends on the drug and kind of where it's working at. Um, just know those are kind of two main sites where they're going to be working. Okay, and then looking at the cell surface receptors, this is where we're going to get our ion link channels, G protein, and enzyme link receptors as well, right? So these are mainly going to be impregnated within that phospholipid bilayer. And so the cells, uh, the drugs don't actually have to cross that cell membrane. Because we mentioned cell membranes tend to be pretty uh, permissive in what they cross over, or is it pretty selective? Very selective, right? So this, if the drugs only have to get out of the cell surface, they don't really have to uh, penetrate that barrier. It makes it easier for them to get that signaling done. So um, these are very common, these ion channel um, linked receptors are very, very common targets for medications. Um, basically, these are also known as ligand gated ion channels or inotropic receptors. Basically, it just means that whenever I have the drug come in and bind to that receptor, it's going to allow it to either open up or it's going to cause it to close. And that can affect the amount of, of ions that are flowing across that. And again, every channel might be a little bit specific. You might have ones that are specific for chloride. Some are going to be very specific for sodium. It just depends on the type of receptor you're dealing with. Um, you're going to find these are very important when we're talking about neurotransmitters. So things like glutamate, GABA. Has anyone heard of GABA before? What does GABA do for us? GABA is like the brakes on the system. It's like basically slowing everything down within the CNS, right? Glutamate's the opposite of that. Glutamate's very excitatory, right? So if I talk about glutamate, it's the main excitatory neurotransmitter. GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it's good. So if you take like, a, if you're really anxious, uh, anyone know what medication you might take for that? Hmm? So gabapentin may be one. What's another com more common one? Anyone ever heard of a Zany bar or Xanax? That's a very common one. You see a lot of, a lot of patients will, will utilize uh, something like a Xanax to calm their nerves, and it works by uh, working through these GABA channels. And basically what it does is it will bind to these receptors, and it will allow it to open up. And one of the things that well, with GABA, the way that it is inhibitory, it actually allows chloride to flow through. So chloride being positive or negative? It's negative, right? So once that flows into a cell, what do you think it does to that resting membrane potential? makes it more negative, right? So I can actually uh, hyperpolarize the cells, make it more difficult to have an action potential. You can start to see where some of these different concepts are kind of coming together and in, in how we can affect those, uh, res those resting membrane potentials, make a cell either more likely to fire an action potential or less likely. Again, those details we're going to cover more in depth when we get into the specific drugs. But different proteins here, you can um, utilize you know, sodium, potassium, calcium, it, or they may be non-selective. It could allow several different um, ions to flow through those. But basically, our drugs are either coming in trying to open these up, or they may be trying to close them off or block them potentially, depending on the drug and depending on the, the circumstance. All right. And normally, they're going to be made up of these different kind of sub um, subset of proteins here. So you can find that maybe in one type of tissue, you may have, uh, say, two alpha type of subunits, but maybe you go to a different tissue that only has one alpha subunit. The, the details here are not so important, but just know that by changing these subunits, you can change how the drug is actually going to be interacting with the receptor. You can change how effective it may be or, or not be, as the case may be. Um, and usually, they're going to have some slight where we're actually going to be having the, the actual binding occurring here, and that's important. If you don't have that, then the receptor can't interact with the drug, and it's just not going to do anything. Right. So in this case, you would find an acetylcholine binding site right here. So you notice here's the lipid bilayer, uh, the receptor sticking out. You would have acetylcholine come in and bind that, and that would open it up potentially. Right. So this may be something like a vagal nerve, or this may be something like, um, you know, something to do with like neuromuscular uh, effect. You know, the acetylcholine is really important for that as well. But so just know different subunits make up these proteins typically. In some cases, based on remember we, um, we mentioned pharmacogenetics. Remember what that was how someone's genes can affect how they respond to a drug. You can actually have people who have different um, polymorphisms where they may actually uh, will change the subunit structure here. We may have, uh, may change what type of subunits you have, which may explain why some people respond really well to one drug, while some people may not respond super well to it. So again, a lot of it goes back to your genetics and kind of what your lineage is and, and how that affects your, how you deal with those drugs.
Okay. Um, again, for any given ligand, there's usually going to be kind of uh, many variations there. And so that based on the five subunits, you know, by changing that, you can have uh, very dramatic effects there. Um, again, most of it's going to be dictated by this, the type of tissue you're dealing with based on what genes are being encoded for, what genes are being transcribed there in the nucleus, and, and uh, you know, eventually how the RNA gets spliced and the proteins get produced from that. So just to give you an example, um, we have different uh, subtypes of different receptors. So for instance, here's a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. You guys are familiar with like nicotinic, and then what's the other type of acetylcholine receptor? Remember there's nicotinic, and then there's muscarinic. Remember that? We're talking about the, the parasympathetic nervous system. Muscarin, uh, muscarinic receptors are very important there. Nicotinic receptors are very important as well. Anyone know what binds to nicotinic receptors? Nice. Yeah, nicotine. That's how we discovered it. it was uh, finding that nicotine bound to these receptors. Absolutely. Again, sometimes it's just that simple uh, when it comes to the names. But there's various re uh, receptor subtypes here. So, for instance, and you don't have to memorize these specific examples. These are really just trying to be uh, illustrative here. Uh, you can have different subtypes. So you have NM. You can have an NN. And so NM would be found primarily on the skeletal muscle. They tend to be excitatory. And it does that by activating it. It will open up and allow increased permeability to sodium and potassium. We you know it's going to raise that resting membrane potential will make it more likely to have an action potential, right? Similarly, you may find an NN that would be responsible uh, or be uh, effective in the autonomic ganglia. So this may be more uh, important in things like the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, it tends to be excitatory. Or then in the case of the CNS receptors, these again are gonna be excitatory, but they work more to release uh, or allow for calcium to flow in. So again, it just depends on the tissue you're dealing with, what type of receptors there are. I'm not going to get super specific and kind of have you guys memorize all of these. Um, this will be more important when we're talking about the adrenergic uh, receptors. When we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system, we talk about betas and alphas and things like that. That'll become more important, but we'll cover those as, as they become relevant. Okay, so example, you know, nicotine, as we mentioned, binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Um, uh, there's also other ones that can actually bind and block those receptors. So for instance, uh, there's a, a product called Curare, which actually is how we have developed a lot of our paralytic drugs. Anyone know what a paralytic drug would do? It would paralyze you, stop all your muscles from working, essentially. And they actually work by blocking up those nicotinic receptors. So we know that we can induce paralysis. And why would we ever want to induce paralysis in our patient? Intubation is a good one. Seizures, not often. We actually don't uh, paralyze for seizures specifically. Any other cases? Surgery. surgery is a big one, yeah. So you, usually, if you're undergoing surgery, you know, major surgery, typically you're going to be paralyzed for that uh, <laughs> process. Um, you know, for intubation is another big one. We're trying to put an uh, endotracheal tube in so we can breathe for the patient. That oftentimes requires paralysis. Again, there's some cases uh, where that is, is necessary. You normally think, oh, that sounds like a bad thing. I would want to paralyze your patient. Usually, you're breathing for them. Though. That's a, kind of the key component because if you don't breathe for them, they're not going to breathe on their own. That's no, no good. Um, other examples, you know, we talk about GABA receptors. We're going to have things like barbiturates. Anyone ever heard of like phenobarbital? These are kind of old drugs that, that kind of work on those GABA channels. Um, we have things like calcium channel blocking drugs. That by blocking calcium channels, you can affect things like heart rate. You can affect things like blood pressure. Those are very important. We're talking about cardiovascular uh, drugs later on. And then all sorts of drugs, you know, that can affect things like insomnia, anxiety, depression, all work on these channels as well. So again, this is a very wide ranging sort of set of receptors. They can affect lots of different things depending on what drug and what tissue you're dealing with. Okay, the next set of type of receptors we have here are going to be our G protein coupled receptors. Notice here how it kind of has this kind of uh, this, this kind of transmembrane sort of structure here, usually seven transmembrane sections here. And this is where the drug is actually going to be binding to. Here's the receptor site here. Again, it's not important to know how many times it crosses the membrane, but this is kind of the general structure you're going to see with these. Usually it kind of gets simplified and kind of looks like that. So this is one of the largest kind of family of, uh, of cell surface receptors that are out there. And these are very important for all sorts of things. So for instance, like smell is very, very important. You know, um, we'll, we'll learn about smell in the next section of physio coming up here. Um, but you can detect large numbers of different types of smells um, uh, based on these different G proteins, based on what's being activated there. And for example, just with like um, in mice, there's a thousand different G proteins just for the sense of smell by itself, right? So again, there's lots of different variations here depending on the amino acid sequence of those proteins. They can respond to different types of uh, different ligands. They can respond to different drugs potentially. And so um, you're going to find that there's lots of different receptor subtypes. So for instance, when we talk about serotonin acting drugs, um, you know, there's lots of different subtypes. So that will be important because serotonin can play a role in nausea and vomiting. You may find that it can have a role in migraines. It can have a role in depression. So we're going to look at all the different receptor subtypes there. We'll talk about them as they become important. But just know these are G-proteins uh, linked receptors, and we'll talk about how they're working here in the next slide.
So basically, you're going to basically have a drug come along. It's going to bind to this. And again, this is on the extracellular space. It's going to bind to this receptor here, and then it's going to cause some downstream effects. And we're going to see what that is right here. Again, we're looking for broad concepts here, so you don't have to get uh, kind of mired down in the details here. But essentially what's going to be happening is normally the G protein is just kind of sitting there by itself, not really doing anything. And you're going to have these kind of inactive G proteins that are located here. So the receptor is here. G proteins are inactive. It's not doing anything. If you were to have the signal molecule come along, you're going to find that these now will associate together. And notice there's GDP. Anyone know what GDP is besides the stick product? So it's guanosine diphosphate. So similar to how we have like adenosine triphosphate or adenosine diphosphate, right? Or ATP, ADP. This is GDP essentially, right? So this is a very uh, kind of a variation on that, but the kind of the base nucleotide is a little different there. So anyway, so we have guanosine diphosphate that will come along, and then it'll actually will pick up a phos uh, phosphor uh, a phosphate group essentially, right? So again, there's a kinase that will add that on. And by adding on another phosphate group, what does that do to the energy of that molecule? It's more active, right? So just like ADP to ATP, ATP has more energy. The same thing's happening here. So actually we'll have GTP uh, binding there, and this will cause these different uh, proteins actually to dissociate. And then they can go along and have whatever downstream effect they're going to have, whether it has an effect on the heart rate, whether it has an effect on the blood pressure, whatever it happens to be, they can go along and have these, their, their downstream effects. And when we get to that, we're going to talk about the secondary messengers and what kind of downstream effects are going to be here, right? And this is actually a variety of kind of second messengers, as we'll see in just a few minutes here. So again, the first messenger is the drug coming down and bind to the receptor, and then we're going to have the kind of the downstream effects. This is one example of that. So you can have the GTP kind of come along. It's going to be able to affect whatever target protein. Maybe it's an enzyme. Maybe it's who knows what's going to be. We'll talk about some examples later on. But basically, uh, eventually that uh, phosphate group is going to be taken off. That, uh, there, it's going to be uh, phosphorylase is going to take off that extra phosphate group. Now you have GDP. It's inactivated, and then it can go and kind of uh, go back to the inactive form with itself. And at that point, you can have another receptor of drug come along, find that same receptor, and then the whole process starts over again. Right. So again, it can be one of these things where you're kind of recycling the protein, so you get kind of multiple uses there. And depending on the, the drug and depending on the enzymes, it may be very quick this occurs, maybe very uh, slow, just depends on, on the, the situation. So just to give you some examples here, so like there's uh, GS, there's GI, there's GULF, probably with the olfactor, it's called GULF, um, GO, GQ. Again, no, not important to get mired down in the details of which ones of these are doing what. I'm just showing you an example of kind of what's going on here. So for instance, um, GS is really important with beta adrenergic amines. So this is like epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, from the sympathetic nervous system. Very important here because they work on doing things like increasing heart rate and blood pressure. And it'll work by the secondary messenger pathway, which we're going to talk about in the next section here. So we'll talk about cyclic AMP in just a few minutes. Um, but uh, these are the kind of the enzymes that they're activating when you have binding of that protein and then you, you kick off that, that G protein coupled receptor, right? Again, olfactory um, uh, epithelium is really another important place for, for G proteins. It's how we get our sense of smell. Um, but lots of different things these are involved in. So again, don't memorize the exact details. Just know the different effects that these can have based on the tissue you're dealing with and, and the type of receptors you're dealing with. So we also have some enzyme-linked receptors. So G protein is going to be one of the main ones that we mentioned. Um, normally, you're going to find that um, we can have... Uh, Various ones here. So again, some other enzyme-linked receptors uh, include things like tyrosine kinases. So we know that's going to be something that kind of phosphorylates it, something. Um, tyrosine phosphate, you know, uh, guanylocyclases. We're going to go over specific examples. We'll talk about the tyrosine kinase ones uh, specifically here, just because this one comes up most frequently in regards to drugs and whatnot. Um, so we'll see what those look like in a minute. So um, again, tyrosine kinase is the most common enzyme-linked receptors. Um, uh, it's better if I show you the picture here, but basically this has a very important role in several things like uh, DNA synthesis, um, cell proliferation, immune responses. So again, these are very important receptors. And in fact, these are starting to be new targets for new drugs. So uh, for certain types of cancers, which we didn't really have a good effect of treatments for previously, we can now uh, target some of these tyrosine kinases and get very, very good effects out of it. Um, so you get lots of different cases here. Um, insulin receptors are also going to be these tyrosine kinases. This is kind of the more common one that we are familiar with based on what we've talked about in physiology so far. So basically what's happening is you're going to notice that the, are, the tyrosine kinase receptor is basically kind of two dissociated proteins initially when it's in the inactive state. Normally it has something come along, usually something like insulin. Insulin is kind of the more common one. It will bind to this. It will then dimerize. I don't know what dimerize means. Yeah, it's going to double up essentially, right? So again, they're going to come together. They're then going to become phosphorylated. Usually ATP is going to be used here. Right, so ATP is going to donate a phosphate group, and now once that's done, it's active. It can have, uh, have a downstream effect. So, for instance, with insulin, once I bind insulin to that receptor, what do you think happens from there? Based on what we talked about yesterday. Mm 
or it's going to cause those glucose transporters to be sent up to the cell surface, and then they can accept glucose to come into the cell, and they can have some new energy production, right? So again, that's one example of uh, how insulin can kind of work. And again, insulin's a drug. We administer this, you know, uh, exogenously all the time for our diabetic patients, so... Okay, and then we mentioned intracellular receptors. This, uh, the biggest things you're going to find uh, here are going to be hormones most typically. So things like steroids, um, thyroid hormone are going to be able to cross over into the uh, membrane either passively or through some carrier protein. And then it can usually go down into the nucleus where it can uh, modify gene transcription, upregulate, downregulate different proteins uh, production uh, overall. So for instance, when I give something like a glucocorticoid, something similar to cortisol, I can administer that. And uh, if I have an area of, say, uh, inflammation, I can actually inhibit that by affecting how the uh, the nucleus is transcribing all of those different uh, inflammatory sort of mediators. So for instance, if I have someone who's having a severe allergic reaction, like an anaphylaxis, I can give them this glucocorticoid. It's going to go down into the nucleus, and it's going to start to change transcription of those different proteins there, right? Which is why it makes sense why the, the steroids work slower, because it has to go and affect the actual production of new proteins rather than actually affecting the proteins that have already been produced, right? So that's how you can see some of these drugs take a little bit longer um, than others to actually work. Okay, and again, you can see how some of these, and most of them are hormones, are going to be able to get down into uh, the nucleus, and it can actually affect things like, you know, uh, which targets we're going to be shooting for as far as transcription goes, and that will then ultimately affect what sort of proteins we end up producing overall, okay? Okay, so these are the main types of receptors we're going to deal with. Next, we're going to move on into the, the secondary messengers that we're going to see, uh, see some of the downstream effects that come about. We'll look at some specific drug examples and how uh, these are going to work. Okay, so any questions on that section? Again, I know it seems like kind of abstract. We're going to make this, um, I'm going to show you some specific examples, but again, these are kind of the high concepts. This will become more um, applicable once we actually get into farm one. We're actually applying it to real real drugs, right? And you're going to be like, why the heck did I learn all this stuff? And then you'll see, oh, okay, that's why I learned it. I still don't think I need to learn it, but I see why we learned it in the first place, right? Anyway, these are like your vegetables. Like, you have to get these down before you can get to the meat uh, next semester, right? <laughs> 